This is Charlie Talbib with Talbib Consulting. Greg Kitson with Minds Eye Graphics. Pierre with Blue Moon. This is Marsha Derryberry with Impressions Magazine. And you're listening to the Two Regular Guys. Two Regular Guys. Two Regular Guys Podcast. 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 Hosted by Terry Combs and Aaron Montgomery. It's the first and most listened to favorite weekly internet radio show in the industry. Take a listen. All right. Well, welcome to the show. It is Friday, March 6th. 2020 and i'm terry combs you can find me at terrycombs.com and uh, i am eric campbell sitting in for aaron montgomery today you can find me at ericcampbell.com uh aaron is here today but for back to the old role now he's pushing the buttons he's running the board and he is in the chat in the background so feel free to give aaron a little hassle in the chat if you want to but <laughs> today we're going to be talking with uh, jeremy picker the creative uh, director and ceo at amber creative and we're going to talk about some creative design development uh applique embroidery retail styles just all kinds of great stuff and i cannot wait to get into jeremy's section it's going to be awesome yeah absolutely Hey, uh, for a couple of news items, uh, Eric, I, I actually reached out to uh, Marsha and Josh over at Impressions Expo yesterday to see mm -hmm. if there's uh, any any buzz about the coronavirus impacting the Atlantic City show. And and they both got back to me and said everything is a go. And based on attendee signups, they are exceeding their expectations. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the reason I reached out was I had a conversation with an industry manufacturer uh, this past week. And he was telling me about uh, some folks that were coming out for a vendor meeting with him and they canceled saying, hey, we don't want to fly right now. And plus, there was an article in The Wall Street Journal last week talking about, uh, I guess it was early this week, talking about mm -hmm. events being canceled across the country. So I, I don't know if it's going to have any impact on, on shows. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be uh, going to, well... I'm not cutting down on flying. I'm going to Chicago <laughs> this course. afternoon. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, on Wednesday, going to Irving, Texas. And and um, we uh, spoke with the folks at, at NBM also. And they said they only had mm -hmm. one vendor cancellation so far. And that was actually somebody coming from a country that they're not allowed to come into the country because of the virus. So uh, wow. we'll see. Hopefully, it'll, uh, it'll all blow over and people will still come out. But uh you know, uh, it, it's it's interesting to see. There was some um, big event in Orlando uh, yeah. that's supposed to be next week. Uh, a um, uh, some kind of a uh, a medical convention, really really big event, and they they canceled that event. And I mean, it was so big the president was going to be speaking there, and so. Wow. Well, no, well, you know, well, I'm not surprised though. Cause I mean, honestly, I saw anybody who's at ThreadX, Jason Rank, who did this excellent, um, as a presentation on online video and here's a comment from Carolyn Cagle real quick. Cause it's popping up here. Uh, it's too cold here to survive. Yeah. She is <laughs> up in the frozen North. It may be true. Uh, but yeah, Jason Rink, who did that presentation of video at ThreadX, really awesome guy from simply film. Um, he came out and was, was showing that there's some problems with possibly South by being canceled South by Southwest out in Austin. And they yeah. were talking about that too. And honestly, I'm like you, Terry. I've got two shows kind of back to back, which for me is a lot. It's not a lot for you, but it's like I'm going out to going out to Atlantic City, coming back pretty close after that, going over to Minnesota for DAX, as we all know. Sure. And yeah. I haven't changed any plans on on my behalf. I mean, I've got several shows before the end of the year, but admittedly, I'm watching because now there's uh, some of the airlines are allowing for cancellations and stuff, too. They're doing some refunding. So. It's yeah. something to watch, folks. I mean, you, you know, uh, speaking of South by, yeah. there are mm -hmm. some big companies that have canceled their uh, their events there. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, I I think it's uh, especially with South by, it's a lot of people gathered in 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 small spaces. If anybody, you know, South by Southwest is in Austin for anybody who doesn't yeah. know, and it's yeah. it's a it's a music and technology and and uh, and movie uh, event, and it's it's a huge huge deal and and it's all not in one place you know they have the convention center and they have all all mm -hmm. these different bars that will have uh events with big bands and it's it's you know it's pretty spectacular event but uh yeah. companies are pulling out of it and so we'll we'll see what happens and hopefully this will all blow over in the next couple of months and we won't be having the conversation about it oh no totally i mean i i'm definitely on that camp where it's like a, my wife, people don't know, is uh, studying medicine. And so it's like, for me, I'm kind of like, hey, guys, you know, wash your hands. The flu is, the flu kills more people every year. Uh, but it is something to watch. And certainly you have to watch what people are doing. So 
I see Carolyn here bought a ticket for Arizona 48 one way, so there is that. Yeah, South, <laughs> Southwest hasn't been canceling anything yet. <laughs> so no, no. I, I will uh, say my flight to and from Chicago is about yeah. half full, and, and usually that's, that's not the case. I've so. been seeing a lot of pictures of just like a ghost ship flights where you're two or three people sometimes in the back of a flight. So, yeah. Everybody yeah. watch that space. We'll certainly report on it, especially because all of us do a lot of uh, teaching and traveling to shows. We'll definitely report and let you know what's going on with the shows. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, um, on that note, unfortunately, I have some very sad news to report uh, from the embroidery world. Um, we've lost one of our veteran educators who had recently moved mostly into the home and kind of craft market, but was part of the formative years for many of the professionals out there in the industry, especially of kind of my generation, uh, Walter Floriani Jr., unfortunately has passed. Um, he educated a number of digitizers in the early days uh, of my career through his fun club, the Floriani United Network, and uh, since gone to teach thousands in that home and craft space. And personally, uh, he has the dubious distinction of being the only educator that I ever attended a class from. And um, he was one of the first people who ever said there are no secrets in embroidery and tried to teach everything in a time when in those old Shifley machine embroiders and beyond that, people did kind of keep things close to the vest. And uh, so what I would just like to say, uh, he gave me an appreciation for the history of machine embroidery through his own family history and, uh, you know, the control that those old school punchers had over their designs. And uh, he will be missed. So I'm um, sorry to report that. But uh, yeah, it's sad I, to hear. Yeah. You know, especially he's he was fairly young. I mean, I, I, I really uh, hate to see someone like that who's got so much to share uh, taken from us. But, yeah. you know, rest in peace, Walter. Yeah. The uh, Aaron there or Aaron, <laughs> Eric, it sounds almost the same. I could just close keep going. enough. It's usually Aaron. <laughs> the uh, the MBM show is hosting their first ever Start Here Academy, which is kind of sounds pretty interesting. It's yeah. going to be in Indianapolis on June 10th from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, the educational conference takes place the night before the start of the MBM show there at the Indiana Convention Center. And this 101 level educational conference provides valuable startup resources for makers and crafters interested in turning their hobby into a business. And that's how a lot of us get started. That's for sure. Right? Oh, yeah, for and, sure. you know, for, for people who also want to add a profit center to uh, to a related business as well. So I don't know a whole lot about that event, but I'm anxious to, to learn, learn a little more about it. And I think it's uh, I think it's uh, a, a really good idea that, you know, there's guys at NBM. They're always thinking outside the box. So. Well, and honestly, I reached out certainly to see what's going on there once I heard about it, because honestly, I've been hammering on this prosumer into professional kind right. of transit, especially in embroidery. It's really common to have that hobbyist thing. In fact, at uh, at the ISS show or at Impressions Expo, I've been teaching a, a hobbyist to professional track, too, that was new this right. year. So honestly, I'd love seeing more of this happen because I think uh, the better we can educate these folks, the better they kind of become good citizens of the apparel decoration world. Right, exactly. Hey, uh, uh, Eric, before we get going here, uh, we want to thank everybody for checking out the Two Regular Guys podcast. If you are listening to the podcast version, we would greatly appreciate you sharing with your friends so they can become regulators too. And uh, we would love and appreciate you giving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening right now. And uh, we are always looking for new guests. If you or anyone you know would like to join us on the show, go to calendly.com slash two. That's the number two regular guys with your show ideas. And, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. And if you're watching us live right now, Join in with your comments and questions uh, over there with Aaron and uh, yeah. reach out to your industry friends right now and have them join us too. And I'd like to say good morning to everybody. Aaron's been popping them up while we're talking. So anybody who's watching the video, you're getting to see that we have Christine, inventor of regulators as a term. We have Sandy, Terry, lots of people jumping in who have been commenting. And so good morning to everybody. Glad to have you on. But uh, with that, let's hear a word from our platinum sponsor, Impressions Expo. What is Impressions Expo? Impressions Expo, formerly known as ISS, is the premier trade show dedicated to the imprinted and decorated apparel industry. They have five shows that are produced annually in each region of the United States, including Long Beach, California, Atlantic City, New Jersey, Orlando, Florida, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and cap off the year at Fort Worth, Texas. Each of those five annual shows also feature over 30 seminars and hands-on workshops in categories such as screen printing, embroidery, digitizing, 
digital decorating, and much, much more. Visit impressionsexpo.com for more details. And while there, use the promo code REGULARGUYSIE for a free expo pass. Again, make sure you visit impressionsexpo.com to get more details. And the two regular guys look forward to seeing you there. All right. Well, thanks again to uh, the folks over at Impressions Expo. And I guess we'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Everybody, come see us if you see us out there at Atlantic City. We have a comment here from Christine Shreve. Uh, Still think we need a drinking game whenever you guys say the name of the show. I do think whenever we hit the number two, that that's to the number two. I think that that's pretty fair. The problem is, uh, guys, it's pretty early in the morning for a drinking game. I'm thinking, uh, you know, mimosas maybe. What's what's okay right now? Anybody? We do we do have uh, we do have a lot of listeners who listen to us later in the day. So <laughs> Feel it's free. a good idea. Podcast version. <laughs> Guys, podcast uh, version if you're exactly. playing. Okay, with, with that, why don't we go ahead and bring on our awesome guest? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Jeremy Picker. Jeremy Picker is the creative director and CEO at Amber Creative, a Colorado based merchandise design firm with over 20 years of experience in the fashion industry. Uh, Jeremy has helped launch and grow merchandise for major label brands, is passionate about creative creating a retail quality merchandise for the nonprofit sector to fuel fundraising efforts and expand awareness. His client list spans from churches to restaurants to corporations, and he designs apparel for Pod Swag, the merch side of Stitcher and Earwolf, doing work for some of the most popular podcasts today, including Conan O'Brien's, LeVar Burton's, Bill Nye's, and more. Uh, Jeremy is also a cancer survivor and a co-founder of Estane, a high-end accessory line to support cancer education. We chat with Jeremy about some of the steps in his creative process for designing merchandise, and Jeremy's going to share freely from his lessons learned while fighting cancer and building a successful business. Welcome on, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks for having All me. All right. Hey, so Jeremy, we were talking before we came on the air a little bit about about your background. So uh, share share that with our listeners. Yeah, so I've <clears throat> been kind of involved in the apparel world since probably the early '90s. My older brother, he's 11 years older than me. He was living in Southern California. He helped start an action sports clothing brand. So ever since I was in junior high, I was going to manufacturers, cut and sew houses working in the back of his warehouse. And, you know, I just wanted to be with my brother. I I had no interest really in apparel at that time. Um, But, you know, from junior high to high school, I would just always go out to be with my brother and naturally kind of learned the whole supply chain, how everything from the concept and development side of things to the manufacturing. And then I would go to these live, these concerts and live events and help him retail the merchandise. So, I got the whole gamut of, of, you know, from concept to, to the sale. And so um, all the way to college in my, in my summers, we would take an RV, we would drive around the whole country and set up, you know, at all the different music festivals and sell merchandise. I, I wanted to be an engineer uh, back in the day, but after calculus two, I was like, no more, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't my calling. So merchandise and apparel was kind of, you know, the, the thing, thing I knew, um, my mom's a seamstress. So I kind of, you know, I could sew a garment before I could swing a hammer, you know, what I wasn't doing the manly stuff, quote unquote. Now, you know, it's, it's more common, but you know, I, I loved fabrics. I loved colors and I, I wasn't planning on being in this industry, but you know, I've, I've come to love it. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, with, and then from probably, 2001 to 2009, I toured with major label rock bands. So I lived on the road in a tour bus selling merchandise for bands. And so I got that retail side of things, you know, the that emotional connection fans would have, you know, to take that souvenir home. So I was more on that retail kind of distribution side. And then uh, in 2008, when I started Amber with my um, ex-business partner, he was on the manufacturing and design side. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I I had to learn the the back end, the manufacturing, the design. And so, yeah, eight years or it's been 12 years now, man, time flies. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, we're doing well, you know, we're uh, here in Denver, Colorado, and, you know, we work with companies all over the country. You know, That's I awesome. always uh, always tell uh, people in my classes, especially the intro intro level classes and seminars. Now, here's your last chance to leave because once you're in the industry, you, you stay. You stay forever. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, again, it, it's like any industry, you know, you, sh you need to be passionate about it. You know, a right. lot of people get into it and it becomes their career. But, um, you know, the, the people that I feel like stick around and I mean, you're a great example, Terry, of, of, you know, you have to be passionate to last this long in the industry. So, right. Right. you know, that's one thing I've, I try to share with people is like, you know, yes, it's cool, but it's, it's a business at the end of the day and sure. it has its ups and downs. So, you know, make sure this is what you want to do. Cause it's not the most glamorous at times. <laughs> no, no, I mean, and honestly, this is something that I tell everybody. It's like, yeah, a lot of us slide sideways on fire into apparel decoration. <laughs> like, we're not, we're yeah. not always like aiming right for it. I mean, uh, by the way, my mom also a seamstress. My dad was a mechanic. My mom's a seamstress. But I, I know that feeling where you're like, I fabrics in the fabric store weren't weird for me ever. So yeah, that's that's I'm, great. I'm on that, but like. Uh, Whenever I talk to people about this stuff, I, I like to say, like, yeah, not only do we slide sideways in, but then it's like Terry's right. Once you get in, the if you are passionate about it, you can dig in and really be here for a long time. Right. But what I'd love to know is like, how did you specifically start uh want to start your own company? Like, how did that come about? Hmm. So touring, you know, I was always gone. I was living out of a suitcase. And my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. She's mm -hmm. like, you need to stop traveling. <laughs> and I'm like, but this is this is all I know. You know, and I, I loved it. You know, it was yeah. just the energy of being in a different city. Um, you know, and we we were selling out arenas. So we had a really, you know, great audience. And everywhere we would go, people were just, you know, the energy was amazing. I had food catered for me, you know, four times a day. So it, I was spoiled, but you know, <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I probably should settle down eventually. You know, I know there's some lifers, but I, I don't. I didn't think that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so, I, I didn't have a job for probably nine to ten months, just because I was making good money. You know, there was this prestige level of you know the the bands I was around, yeah. and so like going to a normal job wasn't wasn't enticing for me. So. I was very selective, but also I used it as an excuse not to work. Um, <laughs> just kind of play, you know. I, I was yeah. I was traveling so long, I, you know. I think I I just needed some downtime. And yeah. then when uh, when I had some downtime, I ended up go, uh, going to live in in Haiti, working at an orphanage randomly. Wow. One of the bands I worked for, they started the orphanage, and you know, I was like, I was tired of just wasting my time in between tours. And so I was like, my parents are, are ministers and they, they were missionaries growing up. And so it was always kind of instilled in me. And, you know, there was like this feeling of needing to help people. And so I went to Haiti, lived there for six months and it, it was a game changer mentally for me and just, you know, really appreciating what we have here in America. And when I got back, I was like, all right, I, I I still love the apparel side. I'm like, I wanted to create great apparel to help this nonprofit raise money um, awesome. and awareness. And so my brother connected me with a guy um, in Arizona who does who does embroidery and applique. And I just got an entry level job with him. I think I was making eight seventy five an hour, driving forty five minutes to and from work um, in the Phoenix traffic and just grumpy every day. But, you know, for me, the guys that were working there, you know, in the manufacturing facility, it's a job to a lot of people. And so they, you know, they weren't necessarily passionate about apparel, but, you know, for me, I always had that, you know, interest of, you know, how is it made? How is it designed? What goes into it? And so the whole time I'm asking, you know, the floor managers, why is Abercrombie using these fabrics? Because we did a lot of R and D for American Eagle, Hollister, Abercrombie back then. When they did applique, not so much anymore. Um, but really diving in, why are they using these stitches? You know, twill that phrase versus felt that doesn't. And so I was just constantly eight hours. You know, I was just hitting them with questions, and they were probably tired of me. But again, I was, I was, I was really interested in it, and probably after six months of working there, I I was tired of driving. I'm like, man, the band world could really utilize applique. And back then there wasn't a lot of domestic manufacturing, you know, a lot of it was overseas. So I went to my old buddy that 
was working for this band merch company and I'm like, Hey man, let's, let's offer them this, this awesome, you know, technique that, you know, bands are, are already retailing very high. So, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, they could bump it up even more, but also have this just unique, this unique factor to it. So in 2008, I, I hit him up. He's like, I actually developed a whole business plan. I just needed someone passionate about operations and production like you are. And I went to my boss. I said, I'm quitting, but I'm going to bring you business, you know? And so I basically leveraged it that you want me to do this, you know, not that I needed his blessing, but if I Mm -hmm. would use him as my manufacturer, um, I wanted him to be on my team. So 2008, we started with applique for the band world and we don't work with any bands anymore because I'm tired of all their egos. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, w- I like to work with people that that value my expertise. But yeah, that started it all applique. Um, awesome. And I still love it to this day, as Eric knows. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> for sure. Well, so, uh, you know, a lot of the work that you share online, uh, you you highlight specialty techniques and treatments. Can can you talk to us a little bit about your your favorite decoration methods? Yeah. And, you know, I always I, I get super excited about all the possibilities. You know, at the end of the day, all because you can doesn't mean you should. So it's really taking into account the client, the audience, the budget. But really, I, I want people to just think in more layers instead of, you know, a print on a shirt. I, I want to see this holistic, you know, design, the product, the fit, the the decoration, the finishing, all of that, I think, makes an awesome garment. Not only that can retail, but, you know, that gets worn. Applique is, I would love to do that all day, every day, just because, you know, I feel like that's one of my expertise. I know all the fabrics and the stitches, um, you know, a lot of it is limited domestically. I know it's very labor intensive. Um, one of my... One of my buddies that uh, was on this article that I had Eric uh, contribute to, he was the head digitizer in over R&D for Abercrombie um, for, I think, four or five years. So he went to all the facilities around the world, setting them, setting them up for mass production of applique and, you know, to be able to make that look authentic how they used to. And so, you know, applique is definitely just because of the textures and the amount of fabrics that y- you can use. And then not to mention how you can integrate screen printing with embroidery and with applique. So I feel like as a creative, that gives so many options to be creative, you know, instead of, you know, we make a cool design and print it, there's all these layers that can really make the garment unique. So that's definitely my number one. Um, Number two would probably, you know, be the, the unique, the unique ink. So HD, uh, one of our our local partners in Denver, they're coming up with this uh, color shifting technique that you know goes from green to purple d- depending on how you look at you know the light, and it's really you know it really is bringing out that unique flair because it's not always for people you know the the, the masses to see. It's for that wear. What's going to make them put that shirt on? You know, it could be the coolest technique, but if it doesn't get worn, it doesn't matter. So it's really how how can you make something that the 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 wearer is going to wear, and then you know other people will see it. But at the end of the day, if it's sitting in the closet, it does any no one any good. So that is probably my second, and then the third is patches. Um, patches on hats has been one of the biggest growing points for me, sure. just because the diversity. You know, you have your Chanel patch, you're embroidered, you're woven your leather, um, you know, you can do metal pieces. And I think there just gives a lot of flexibility, not only on inventory, because you can make a bunch of patches for a low cost and then just hold them. You don't have to, you know, order these high, high volumes with full custom hats. And you can put the same patch on different types of hats, on a polo, on a jacket, um, on a tote bag. So I think there's a lot of diversity and it's really been something that has has uh, helped me grow in the last few years. 
Oh, patches are awesome. And honestly, I've been writing about patches forever and kind of once again, banging that drum because I really, I, I've always loved it. Now, personally, part of me is also like this classic look, this look that was from a pr previous time. Because I remember when we tried to put patches on hats early in my career, you would do that. And they'd be like, I don't want this like 1970s trucker hat with a patch <laughs> right. on it. Nobody wanted that. You couldn't get a patch on a hat. And now it's like, you can't not put patches on hats right. all the time. I'm teaching people how to get them attached. And the great thing, and I hate to just bring this up, something else kind of off the off the subject but it's like i just saw technology from uh zsk at in long beach where they had computer vision that was attaching patches and also locating the patch and seeing the design and being able to add in things like merge you could throw text on individual pieces and it would know where the patch was and align it wow and it was it's like so patches are coming up more and more the attachment ver uh, uh, the ways to do the attachment the ways to customize them really awesome Okay, comment for Brian Bailey. I knew this was coming. <laughs> patches, we don't need no stinking patches. Yes, yes. <laughs> we do need patches. They don't stink. You, but you know, you know, one thing that's <laughs> that that uh, a lot of our guests and and you know, you've just said it yourself, and and so many of our guests will say, "I wanted to know what that looked like, so I just I printed it or I, I embroidered it or I, I I experimented." I and. and you know, the folks who are successful in this industry, that's what you hear over and over and over again. I, I just wanted to try it. So and, yep, totally. and you're a perfect, perfect example, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's tough because I'm not a manufacturer, you know, I, I'm, I'm a middleman, I'm a broker, but we, we work with our, our manufacturers again, they, they don't necessarily have have the capacity to do a lot of R&D. Maybe if you're a bigger shop or even smaller and you know you have you don't have the clientele that is, you know, keeping you busy 7 days a week, it's how can you take what these major brands are doing, you know, in retail and Super Dry is one of my favorite brands yeah. for research because they're doing every special technique and I know not all of it can be done domestically, but it gets you inspired to to see what's out there. How can you mix HD? How can you use woven labels? And yeah, the you know the stay curious. I think that is important because we can all you know it, it can become a widget. But how do we keep it fresh and unique? And not only for us, but you know the customers. How can we help them elevate their brand? And you know again, not everyone needs to push the envelope, but knowing that everyone wants something different and fresh and it's our responsibility to to help them find that or help them to know what the options are even if they don't ever do applique them knowing that you can do it i feel breed, breeds credibility and trust Dude. It's huge. And also, I'd like to tell everybody, go follow Jeremy's uh, Instagram as well. Uh, he and I are both big fans of retail research. We go check out some of these retail samples and see what stuff is possible because there's a lot of things going on in that space that you just yeah. don't necessarily see. It's not all throw a logo on different locations on a garment. There's so much more you can do. But uh, as Jeremy mentioned, also, uh, he was doing an article from Impressions Magazine. So if you haven't seen that yet, go out and check this month's Impressions for an awesome article about some of these techniques. Uh, but and by the way, thank you, Aaron, for putting up the link in the comments. So there's a link to Amber Creative. Uh, but we t it was all about specialty embroidery and applique. Now, I mean, they focused a lot on specialty stitches and threads, which I know like you, you are such an applique guy, but they jumped on that specialty thread, specialty stitch stuff pretty heavily. Um, is there anything you wish would have gotten into that article that you want to share now that you got a voice to do it? Yeah, soapbox. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard, you know, you have 1500 words to fit in everything. And I think part of why I brought you in, because again, I'm not, yeah necessarily technical i know how things are made but when it comes you know to needles and and run speed and cams and all that i i'm i'm not smart on that so that's i want to bring in guys like you and then my buddy joe kramer and yeah. really be able to to help people in our industry those that are technical how can i make it uh production friendly and streamline the process because at the end of the day all because it's cool if you can't make any money on it or you know it's taking you too long then it's not worth you know doing so how can i bring guys like you in to to be able to talk about these these thread um thread weights and then you know or the text and you know i on one of your podcasts we <laughs> talked about you know the the different thicknesses of threads and how you know the higher you go versus the lower you go depending on the terminology and so those are things that for for the end customer they don't they don't care about they don't 
need to know all of those all of those things. But for people in our industry, they don't only need to know how it needs to look, but they need to know how to how to get it done. So, you know, on the applique side, having, you know, single and uh, one and two layers and going into the laser bridge, you know, being able to streamline production with that, you know, I've never had uh, working with the, the laser bridge and I know it can streamline, but it's also limited with some of the you know really unique processes with with multi layers and 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 um, you know causing it to fray and you know using these these different fabrics so you know those specialty stitches that you show, showed me and then that you have on your website I mean it's mind boggling not only how you get it digitized or how you digitize it but how it you know looks and how unique it is you know and I think pushing people that going beyond just your satin stitch or fill stitches, I think brings value. And then on that applique side is how can you add some applique, but not go crazy on cost. So mixing mm -hmm. that multimedia with the screen print and then just maybe a little applique or, you know, uh, one piece of applique with embroidery on a shirt. So that article I think I had, you know, double the, the tech part, <laughs> but really, you know, me and you talked about doing another, uh, you coming on my podcast about talking about those things more. Again, knowing what's possible, I think is really important. Again, not that every client needs it and not, it's not necessarily going to be easy to source if you can't do it in house, but really just knowing and, and sharing with your customers. Again, it builds, it builds that trust and, I'm using these articles not only to get out what's in my head and my philosophy for mm. people in our industry, but it also helps me build credibility with my customers of, hey, I'm yeah. I'm showcasing this, you know, for my industry. You can trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Subject matter expert. That's, that's a serious thing, man. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about design development. What what does the process look like when a customer comes to you, and you know how do you start that process of creating their their look, their image? Yeah. So you know, the most of my clients aren't like clothing brands. Um, they are companies that have a core product, and then they produce merchandise to to support you know their mission. So. The way we we start it, it, and we try to do the full package. Obviously, a lot of companies have their own internal graphics, but we all know, you know, some of the files we get, and you know, it's twelve colors, or you know, they're they're printing it over the shoulders and over the seams. You know, it's it's hard to deal with that, and it's like when I quote them, they're like, "Whoa, this is expensive." And slowly, I try to educate my customers that you want us to design for you. Yes, it's an added cost, but we're going to not only design and budget, we know how to design for manufacturing. We know squeegee right. speeds and mesh counts and threat, you know, how, how much it's going to cost with the amount of uh, stitches. And so we, we have some proprietary software called our design survey, and it's basically a visual survey that we send our clients to, to select shirts and in design styles that they like. So it, it's hard in words if you're not a creative and or if you're not in this industry it's hard to communicate what you're looking for a lot of times so you know you get these i want something edgy but clean you know or like streetwear but preppy and it's these yeah. kind of competing styles that it needs to be not only text but visual and so we we break up our custom design work into five different categories from type treatment, you know, simple typography to full illustration. And mm. we tell people, you know, we're not going to charge you by the hour. We're going to charge you by the output. So, you know, you shouldn't be paying for my coffee breaks. It's up to us to get to that point to learn how to create that design in a, a time that we can remain profitable. So we, it, let's say they're, they're, they're wanting something, you know, with a, a, a simple icon and some custom type. We, in our design survey, we have them uh, click on that tab and then we we break up the design styles into prep collegiate, vintage mm -hmm. retro, um, prep, um, artistic abstract and streetwear, just kind of five awesome. compass genres. And so depending on what style they think, because I know the marketplace, they know their customer. 
So I have them show me what they like. You know, if you can't tell me, oh, I like this type or I like the way it's laid out or I like this color scheme. And we use, you know, maybe six to eight images plus their text of I want this as my main text. I want the year. If they say they want the website, I'll talk them off the ledge. Um, for the most part, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm very particular and I, I, I try to get them to say, no one is going to necessarily read your website on a t-shirt. You have like two or three seconds for them to yeah. see it, but no one's necessarily going to go to your website from the t-shirt. Anyways, I and it's guess. HTTP. Shop or something. Oh, yeah. I know. Every time I talk to people about that, I'm like, there's better things you can do at the back of your hat to make people want to look at the front. If you're desperate <laughs> than to put your website over the back. And then I make everybody raise their hands in all my classes. I'm like, okay, who's copied a phone number or website out the back? Like, sure. And I don't pause at all. I go, okay, great. Nobody. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Every time. And I'm also, and this is my other thing I do. And I'm going to lean into the camera. I always go, if someone does this to my chest and leans, in on me, I'm I'm going to be slightly offended after a while. Like I'm gonna be like, that's personal space, folks. Like you know, yeah. you're not gonna lead it and read websites and on hang stuff. Tag, the hang tag's a good idea <laughs> for that website, you yeah. know. It's yeah. a simple way or uh sure. you know a flyer printed on a bag and then put the garment in the bag. So and then on that design, yeah. we give it to our, our design team. I have an art director and then me and him depending on the client for our bigger clients like, you know, pod swag, we, I get involved in the creative process for some of the other clients. I, I don't necessarily have the capacity, but we mm. take that visual survey and he puts some concept sketches. Again, we, we used cool. to go full design and then when they turn them away and when you have to start from scratch, it just, it just ate up too much time. And so we start with a, a pencil sketch or a Wacom, you know, makes it look like a pencil sketch. And then we work it out there. It's a lot easier to manipulate the sketch than the full digital design. So after we work through that with the customer, we go to digital and then we mock it up on our preferred colorway from what we're mm. seeing in the industry. I like to say I'm politely opinionated. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not just going to, I'm the expert, you know, I'm not that I'm saying that to them, but I'm saying yeah. I'm always going to be politely opinionated because I know the marketplace. I'm watching the trends. I'm seeing what people are buying in retail. It's not just Jeremy's taste. It's what I'm seeing that your customer is seeing in retail. So we we give that. And then we have we have some secondary colorways. And then sometimes mm -hmm. we'll throw a vintage texture if you want it a little distressed. Or, you know, we'll put a little woven clip label or inside tag depending on the client. And, you know, we have, I feel like, perfected that whole design process to have mm. minimal, minimal revisions. You know, we only allow two revisions for our customers and 95% of the time we make it in that, that, that um, process because we're asking the right questions. When you say you don't like something, we're not like, okay, let's start over. We say, do you like this or that? And then if they didn't like the font, we'll show them six font styles. Do you like this font, this font? And it really helps them go into our funnel to simplify the process. You know, I see a lot of design firms or, you know, these large scale um, graphics companies and they're like unlimited revisions. And I'm like, that's a nightmare. It's, you would only give unlimited revisions if you can't figure out what the client wants. So um, that design process, and then after design's approved, then we start talking about, you know, fabrics and um, embroidery or, special eating techniques, you know, again, it, it doesn't necessarily always fit in budget, but we'll say mm -hmm. for another quarter, another 50 cents, you can get some HD ink that can bring some depth and, you know, make the, the, the graphic just have a little more uh, texture. So, you know, it's not all the time it works, but for those customers that really trust our expertise and have those proven retail results, um, they mm -hmm. always say, make, make me something that, you know, my, my audience will love. I mean, do you think you get more pushback in general when you're doing this retail style stuff? Like, as you say, uh, which I love, I'm going to steal politely opinionated. I'm stealing that. That's awesome. Do it. Uh, I'll, I'll credit you first. Like, like uh, Terry always says, I'll credit you the first time. The third time I say it, it's mine. Yep. It's <laughs> <laughs> Terry taught me that one. No, but do you think that there's more pushback when you're trying to do retail styles? Or uh, do you think like, are some people so used to that, you know, we're going to take a logo that we already have and slap it on something that they push back a little bit? Or are, what kind of challenges do you face when you're doing that development? And honestly, why do you think it's important to get that retail style out there? 
Yeah. So I think it's obviously all depends on the audience, but mm. at the end of the day, what are those people, whether they're, you know, a seniors group or teenagers or, you know, um, maybe a corporate setting, they are all purchasing something in retail. They're using their hard earned money. It does, you know, cool is relative. I, what I think is cool, what you think is cool, what you think is cool is all, all very different. So is really understanding what is their style or where are they, they purchasing their merchandise? Mm -hmm. You know, if they are ordering, you know, let's say from Ralph Lauren, that's where, you know, applique and, and polos come into play. Or if it's a, it's, you know, a snowboard camp, knowing what they are purchasing dictates what we're going to offer them. So I used to get pushback, you know, I used to chase orders. And mm -hmm. I think with maturity, I've come to find who I am and who my ideal customer is. Um, you know, I stressed out too much just trying to chase every order. And I think part of it, I'm a natural, I'm a people pleaser by nature and I want everyone to have cool merchandise, but it was to my demise, you know, it, it was running me ragged. So yeah, I used to get a lot of that pushback and I used to take offense to it. Um, but now, you know, I think I have, have worked and find the clients that are aligned with my philosophy and that really understand the value. You know, one of my local customers over the last two years, I've helped them grow 200% in retail wow. sales by taking in those trends, by them letting us be creative and and create their whole merchandise from apparel, which that's that's my life, you know, but <laughs> I've gotten yeah. the promotional side of the business and that's been a huge uptick in my business because now I can create this full merch line that's cohesive that you know, a t-shirt might get worn once a week or once every two weeks, but mm -hmm. an awesome, you know, an awesome mug, you know, a tumbler, it can be used every day. So like the, the cost per impression, I've been pushing that a lot lately and showing oh, that yeah. why are retail companies selling them for $30? Why do they have this perceived value is even if you're not retailing them, even if it's a giveaway, if it's for volunteers, I still want to put that that focus into it because why are people going to use it? Why are people going to um, wear it? You know, it's, yeah. it's because it has that retail appeal, not necessarily it's only for retail. Well, that gosh, everybody who says I can't get sales. Well, we always talk about it. You know, retaining a customer is easier than getting a new customer. Well, mm -hmm. also pressing in on a package deal. Number one, I have to, if I could high five you right now through the camera, I would, cause all the stuff you're saying, I've been like <laughs> banging on forever. Cause I'm like, uh, package deals, coordinating gear. It doesn't have to replicate the logo the same everywhere. You yeah. know, it's things that make sense and look more like retail products. It's awesome. But then people who are trying to do sales, like I said, you can penetrate further into your existing sales pool by having these other products. And especially when you've done like Jeremy has done, you've got a tribe that trusts you and that is now going to come to you for that kind of work. Then you have that ability to really give them something comprehensive that really your competition isn't going to do. I mean, the people yeah. who are just throwing logos on whatever they get, uh, it's a very different experience. And if someone comes to you and gets this result, like Jeremy said, you get that like result where people are want to wear your promotional gear because it's so cool yeah. and you get those impressions, that's, you can't beat that. And, and anyone who's just slapping logos on garments is going to be behind on that trend. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. If the order is, is a good enough size, I'll take it. You know, oh, like sure. if they, if they want to be the creative director and they just want the logo, I'm all about it. But again, I'm politely opinionated. I, I, I say the logo is the foundation, mm -hmm. but how do you create lifestyle? You, what do you stand yes. for? What is your mission? And you're not a, most companies aren't an Under Armour or Nike or North Face. You don't have that brand equity in your logo. I always, you know, I'm like, what do you stand for? Let that be your focus and let your logo be secondary, whether it's on, you know, another location or an inside tag or a woven clip label. Like, you know, I, I think people value their logo so much that aren't in the apparel world that yeah. you're missing out on a lot of sales because how many logoed shirts of a brewery or a company can you have? But if you're creating this lifestyle of brand of what problem you solve, or, you know, I, one of my articles, I talked about um, Slack and, you know, how mm. many 
logos are you going to have on your shirt, but show what problem do you solve? We help people collaborate or let's collaborate, yeah. bro. You know, like having something that is stands for what you what problem you solve versus just your logo. So again, it, it's the, always is it always that balance. It's always good to have that foundational logoed wear. But why are more people? Why are your employees going to wear? You know, is it a uniform or is it something that embodies what you as a company culture believes? And so that's what I I try to push a lot. That's really right. cool. Well, hey, I have a podcasting question. And speaking yeah. of my my camera just reverted to my <laughs> laptop which is covered up for whatever reason uh, <laughs> so you didn't like what i was saying terry <laughs> i was just yeah, terry like, spilled out where, where did i go i could hear everything my microphone's still on <laughs> and yeah weird but uh speaking of podcasts uh <laughs> I, I have to ask you about pod swag um yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what kind of designs uh, that you do for podcasters and is there a secret to great swag uh, for that side of the marketplace yeah, I think I think the industry still fresh, even though, you know, you've you've had 300 episodes like the mass market. It's they're slowly coming around. So, you know, Conan O'Brien was an our first kind of project with them, which, you know, we either if we didn't nail it, we, we would have lost that whole account. But really, we're trying to do that market research again. We don't listen to all the podcasts, but we need to hear how they are talking what are their coin terms what are their client are their their audience saying about the podcast or you know the 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 communication not even just the the podcaster it's the community what are they talking about what's resonating so mm -hmm. we do that market research and then you know we're applying it to the type of program so you know i mean conan he has a great audience He's funny, he's silly, he doesn't take himself seriously. So we wanted to bring that into the merchandise. Um, you know, with with Bill Nye, the science guy, you know, it, we needed to have fun with it. So, you know, we did a custom mug that looked like a beaker. Um, you know, we did a shirt that looked like it was his chalkboard writing um, with LeVar Burton, LeVar from, you know, Reading Rainbow and uh, Georgie LaForge. He he reads on his podcast, he reads about science fiction. So we wanted to bring his past um, mm. you know, into that space. And so I think part of it, it's fun for me as a creative because every podcast is going to be very different. Um, the office ladies has probably been the most successful on the merch side of things because I mean, their tribe is die hard, you know, it hasn't been on TV for what, four years now maybe more mm -hmm. well, well tell people what that is that, okay. that by the way that's my daughter's favorite podcast <laughs> yeah and i mean you know it's they're very bubbly so you know get ready for uh it you know they can be crazy at times but the office you know they ran for eight eight years the show and, the office right yeah and so the podcast you know they go through every episode not every i think they're going through 150 episodes that they signed up for and they basically talk about the episode behind the scenes you know kind of b-roll the the people involved and so we really wanted to take not a, because there's a lot of legal things with nbc you know for for their merchandise we have to do a lot of things that that uh, I guess explain or show some of the things from the show, but we can't use names and exact the terminology. So it, it makes it fun because we know we're fans. So that helps. And we, we know what other fans really love. And, you know, again, doing the market research is so important. You, you, not everyone can do it for every customer. You have to, you know, I always say, start with your top 20%. Those are the ones that are going to have the more opportunity to grow, not necessarily, you know, the camp that orders once a year. So obviously you, you want to put that time into people that can scale um, and to have the quantities and budgets for it as well. So doing that research and really digging in, because once you kind of know who they are, you're able to give them a product mix that the fans are going to really like, um, you know, one of the other podcasts, it, you know, they're, they have the comedy bang, bang, you know, they're, they're crazy and silly. So how can we bring this a custom design in 
that is on brand, but again, it, it, it doesn't take them seriously. It's, it's a podcast, you know, there's a, especially on the comedy side of things, but I think at the end of the day, I mean, there's so many podcasts. So I think it, it's a ripe industry um, for people in our industry to, to work towards and to, um, you know, even if you go and start at, at smaller and mid-sized ones, if they have a decent audience, they are going to buy merchandise. Um, you know, I know print on demand is, mm -hmm. is going to be big for a lot of those smaller people because they, they can't necessarily afford the inventory, mm -hmm. but how can you get in on the ground floor and scale, you know, as they grow popularity and like anything, a lot of those are going to fail within, you know, the first six months. But again, you finding that right um, podcast that can grow, I think, having a good web store is important cross promoting. Sure. So the office ladies at the end, they talk about their merchandise where Conan doesn't and mm -hmm. sales reflect that, you know, it's, it's you, even cool merchandise needs to be sold. It needs to be promoted. It needs to be shared. Um, and a lot of times that's hard for us because we aren't involved on that side. So helping your customers, giving them suggestions, doing some research and giving them some quick tips on how to promote your merchandise on your podcast. It's yours. So yours as in the whoever the podcaster is, get them to, hey, all, a lot of you have asked for, you know, our coin term t-shirts, whatever it is, go here and we have a bunch of merchandise. It helps us stay on, on, you know, on the air and um, we would love for you to go check it out. I mean, something simple like that could increase sales by two, three, four X. And I think that's the thing. You really have to get people involved, no matter what it is that you're doing. It's so there's always education. I mean, we, we hammer on that a lot, but I think there's always education you have to do with your customers too. And that makes a, a great point, especially when you're talking about somebody who's doing promotion like that. They're usually pretty much naturals if they're, if they're doing well at promoting their podcast, there's nothing wrong with having them, you know, in on the idea that, you know, we're, we're going to sell more merch if you get on there and promote it. And, yeah. I, and I think people that are that are uh, tied into a podcast, they they feel like that's a way that they can help promote that 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 podcast and help sure. support it. I should say. Yep. So, Eric, hold up your coffee mug. Oh yes, of course. Our, uh, our nice <laughs> two regular guys coffee mug. OG though, this is like the 2013 OG uh, regular guys award winner. By the way, I was a. <laughs> Several times, Reggie Award winner before I became part of the show. <laughs> I mean, that, that is a great example of sustainability in the fact that the shelf life of a product, if it's the yeah. right product, if it resonates. I mean, think about how many times that mug has seen other people have seen that mug. Again, it, it goes to yeah. show that the power of good merchandise versus, you know, one that ends up at the thrift store or, you know in the trash that never sees the light of day. So oh, that's the you always say, what you've been saying over and over is when it resonates, right? When it resonates with the audience, that's the way it goes. I mean, that's, that's when it really gets taken up. Cause I mean, I love this mug and, and these two dudes who are on the <laughs> for great dudes, um, good regular dudes, good regular dudes. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like part of it. Yeah. Because it was a personal thing that reached out. They're like, Hey, you won an award on the podcast. We're sending you this bug. It's it has award yeah. winner on it. It's personal to your experience with us. That's, that's a good chunk of it. So, you know, I think that's awesome. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, giving your, your uh, guests, you know, yeah. merchandise and let them promote it on their social channels, not only the podcast, but getting, you know, showing that merchandise. And I just posted yesterday of Bill Nye wearing our merchandise. And I'm like, when the boss likes it, you know, when they like the merchandise, it's going to go a long way. You know, you can do a Google ad all yeah. day long, but the sales that are going to come from the celebrity or, you know, the, the, the owner or the, you know, the brand representative wearing and using that product. Um, you know, I think it goes a long way. No, absolutely. Um, though I, I'm going to drop something out. We've been talking about real specifics here. I want to go to something yeah. kind of broad because you had something in a post recently that kind of struck a chord with me and I thought I want to briefly hit on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, this is like the controversial post. Uh, you had a post that said uh, companies don't need more suppliers. They need more solutions. And it seemed like in the promo product space, at least that made a little bit of like, there were some waves there. People were talking oh, about man. this. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. And what are like the challenges for direct decorators who are creative dealing with like purchasers? Yeah. So the, the start of that tweet was because I lost a couple customers. Mm -hmm. Um 
due to soul solely on on price and not seeing the value of merchandise again it's i want to work with people that want that value what i bring to the table you know i think you know interviewing your customers just as much as them interviewing you is important and it stemmed that anyone can go get a shirt printed you can go online there's you know a ton of screen printers locally but that's not supply is not people's problem it's demand especially nowadays maybe back then when there wasn't a ton of you know we didn't have the internet and where do you find you have the local screen printer that's all you had but yeah. now there's so much competition is people need to help with the demand of a product not just supply because you could supply and no one likes it and that customer won't come back and they'll most likely blame you you know for for it not selling or you know no one liking it so that that philosophy of how do you help people create demand is through solutions and specifically to the customer so they need to know how and why people will wear that shirt and how to deliver it and how that t-shirt is the right product or is it a water bottle or is it a tote bag or is it a backpack that that's a solution again supply is just one aspect and a lot of times in our industry we kind of wash our hands once we deliver that product but it's in our best interest to somehow stay involved or stay in front of them so that they know how to to get rid of that product so they either reorder or come back again for something new um yeah. you know inventory is a killer so some of my clients i go to their restaurant and i see a, a, the shirts on a hanger in the corner i'm like people people don't assume that that's for sale you need price tags you yeah. need to promote that merchandise and so just one little occasional tip. dusting oh <laughs> man you got it and the dust says all everything about it no one's buying this shirt you know? <laughs> yeah. so it, 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 it takes time and you can increase sales just by a few little tweaks and so that tweet was kind of i think whatever viral for me that's been my most uh viral tweet as far as people were just fired up about you know and, I, and in the the text i i talked about pro procurement departments and how mm -hmm. you know they're there to be fiscally responsible they don't care about if the product's right or what the the impact it's going to be or the shelf life they're looking for budget 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 and so mm -hmm. this sparked i mean there's some industry veterans jamie Mayer um and mark graham and danny rose and all those guys that are creating these huge kind of branding agencies and they probably they have way more experience than i do but you know they were they were like you know this is what is wrong with with companies and merchandise and so you know yeah. i think through that i got you know we're going to do another podcast on on one of those um you know podcasts that we're going to talk about that and you know not that we are going to be able to combat it a lot of corporations that's how they roll but the more we can educate people on how to deal with those barriers of you know yes i can supply you that and but racing to the bottom everyone <laughs> loses except the the person you're making it for they it's not a partnership it's you know they'll go somewhere else and so you know i, I don't tr i don't like to get in those bid wars or you know yeah. rfqs but sometimes you know it's it's part of what we have to do especially if it's a big customer um but yeah i'm excited to see where that goes because i'm going to learn so much about because i haven't even dealt with some of those fortune 500 companies that are all corporate and they you know the hr department doesn't care if it's a soft fabric you know <laughs> right <laughs> well you know um, print, yeah as we're coming up to the uh to the end here and yeah. we will be in bonus time <laughs> uh -oh, sorry yeah. no. <laughs> no problem this has been great but uh aaron sent us some pictures with you and some very famous people like Pey peyton manning and folks like that how, how did you end up being photographed <laughs> with uh with celebrities um, something I learned from my wife is to be relentless and you won't get if you don't ask. And so I'm normally a shy, shy person until I, I start talking to someone. I'm not necessarily proactive to, 
you know, go and just go up and talk to someone. It goes back to my insecure teenage self. I would never go up to girls. I was waiting for them to come talk to me. But um, Dave Grohl, my sister-in-law is a, a, f- a photographer out in LA and she photographs celebrities um, for a living. So she's best friends with Dave Grohl. And, you know, when he comes to town, he, you know, brings us back to his dressing room and we hang out with him. And, um, you know, he, out of all the bands that I've been with, he is seriously the coolest, most down to earth guy I've ever met. I've, I've met people that are a 10th famous as him that have this just ego. Dave Grohl seriously is the coolest, best rock star in the world. (laughs) So again, you know, that I gave him a t-shirt, but it was too late for him to put it on. But anyways, next time I'll learn. And then Peyton Manning, um, I, uh, we were a part of some fundraisers, uh, for, uh, breast cancer research. It's called men for the cure here in Colorado. And every year they have a, um, a keynote speaker and, uh, me and my wife brought him a tie. We get our ties manufactured in, um, Italy by, you know, the best manufacturing houses that do everything, you know, Prada, Gucci, all of the luxury brands we wanted, to bring some luxury goods that do good in the world. And so we, me, my love of sourcing and in the supply chain, we, we went to Italy on vacation and we basically knocked on doors of manufacturers and we found the right one. And they, they produced our, our ties, you know, they they retail two to two to $300, but we, we give 15 to 20% of our sales back to, um, nonprofits. And again, my wife is a dye chemist. She's, you know, she's a PhD in organic chemistry and she works in the cancer diagnostics industry. And when I got sick, it kind of merged both of our worlds together. And so we started, we wanted to bring, um, you know, this, this fashion approach to, to philanthropy and to fundraising. Um, so I brought a tie. I'm like, I am going to go up to Peyton. I am going to gift him a tie, tell him about our company. And, um, you know, he, he's very philanthropic. So I, I, yeah, I, he, I'm a pretty big guy for the most part, you know, I'm six two two forty. I felt like a little kid with Peyton Manning. <laughs> his hands were just like big as bears, man. He, he is a big dude. He might not look like it on the field, but yeah, it, I was a little, I was a little uh, starstruck. So um, <laughs> my my mouth was dry, but yeah, it's you know I think a lot of the times, a lot of people are like, well, I'm not going to be able to get to that person, and yeah. you know, for me, learn being in the band world, I yeah. would learn how to get backstage, even if it wasn't my show. You know, I knew how to talk the lingo. So you know, I think just part of being persistent, and if you want to meet someone. DM them on all social media channels, you know, figure out a way to make it happen. Don't take no for an answer. So that, you know, that relentlessness. Um, yeah, I, I, I am meant in my, you know, experience. I want, I want to serve the, everyone wants to serve big brands, but I know the impact that I can create, especially on the nonprofit side, the more, celebrity status people I come in contact with, you know, I, I like being behind the scenes, but I want to help others help others. So, um, yeah, that was my drive to to (laughs) meet those guys. Well, Hey, just for clarification, your wife did not have trouble with calculus that I'm going to guess. Nope. (laughs) Yeah. She's an overachiever. Uh, she got her MBA from, uh, from Wharton. She, she got a PhD, two masters and, uh, I got a college degree, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I created, I created my own, my own future. And uh, yeah, she's just from a family of academics. So um, I think cool. maybe that's why I was attracted to her. <laughs> well, I, I know that feeling with my wife doing medicine, it's the same kind of thing. I have a very similar track. You, you and I are destined to be buddies now. You, you marry <laughs> up, right? <laughs> right. I just had that thing where everybody's like, oh, Eric, because I, like, I I got in trouble on my podcast last week on, on the, the other one that I do because I jumped in and started talking about, uh, you know, Maslow's pyramid of needs, the hierarchy of needs as a way to talk about goods. And, and somebody's like, yeah, there's Eric going from Beowulf to Maslow. But I was like, <laughs> you don't know in my house, I'm not the smart one in my house. So <laughs> don't worry. With you. By association, right? You know, yeah, people that are smarter and more successful than you. 
also like hey, hey hey folks uh yeah that useless degree i got on the way here it's that's i get to talk at dinner parties yep it's good for linkedin bio yeah right, <laughs> right. Well, I definitely want to be able to put links in the show notes because you've got a lot of awesome stuff that you're doing. Oh, by the way, Christine Shree, you've got to love men who love smart women. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, but I'd love to give you a chance to do some promotion, man. This is time for plugs. So promote your car, right. business, your podcast. Where can we find you? Where can all of our audience find you? Yeah, so I'm most active on LinkedIn and Twitter at uh, JW Picker or Jeremy Picker on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, JW Picker. Um, I'm slowly building my own personal brand because you know apparel is only one aspect i my there's a three in all my names amber with the three um i'm i'm launching picker my last name with the three um and the three is business fashion and community and those are kind of my three passions and um so at you know i want to help not only on the apparel side but you know startups and entrepreneurs um, you know, cause running a business is a struggle. It's a, you know, it's a grind and it's not for everyone. So if I can help some of the people that are, that are wanting to be an entrepreneur or wanting to start up, whether they're in the apparel world or not, um, you know, I want to do that. And then our podcast is called the ink and thread podcast. We're only seven episodes in and we're still trying to figure out our flow, but we want to bring in industry creatives. You'll be on there, you know, uh, technical experts, um, you know, manufacturers, suppliers, graphic designers. I have a buddy that um, produces um, for brands and Tilly's and, you know, he's he's an industry vet and his his whole side of the business is very different. So I want to just bring in other perspectives and help people that really care to to learn more and to, you know, to educate themselves about that again, I'm from that creative retail approach, not always from the sourcing and manufacturing. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why I, I want the experts to be, I want to work with the people that are best in, in their fields. Um, so I can help the customer at the end of the day, but yeah, I'm, um, a stain is, is our, our, um, kind of give back brand. You know, we, we want to educate, you know, about early detection and I, I feel like cancer is a, a tough subject. You know, a lot of people think it's taboo, but having those conversations going to get checked out if you don't feel right um, yeah. is much more important than just the advancement of medicine because, you know, if you wait too late, it's too late. No medicine can help. So, you know, I just, me and my wife want to educate. And then, yeah, Amber Creative, we were a design firm first and then we source product um, from t shirts to to drinkware and everything in between. So yeah, thanks for, Fantastic. thanks for letting me do that. And I uh, appreciate you guys having me on the, on the podcast. I, awesome. as you can tell, probably I, I could talk about this for a couple more hours. So as, 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 as could we, so it's been <laughs> great having you on the show, Jeremy. It was thanks, uh, Terry. super interesting. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for being on. All right. That was awesome. awesome. <laughs> that's a good one, man. Rare is the show where, honestly, I think we lose track of time. And that was one where I'm like, I looked yeah. down, like, oh, man, we're already in bonus time. We're still on. So that was awesome. Thank you, Jeremy, for coming I, on. I, and I had more questions, man. So <laughs> we'll just have to have him back. Everybody, go in, go check out the video. Go back and check out the comments, especially on Facebook. Uh, jump into the comments and see it. It was really great. And actually, I agree with Cindy. Great show. Yeah, that was an awesome show. So let's go quickly. We're going to jump into some other events real fast at the end of this because we are way into bonus time. But I'm just going to go over some stuff. And I know Terry's got events coming up uh, for me. Big one for me is I've got that demystifying digitizing webinar coming up at the end of this month. Now, uh, there, it is still going on March 28th, 2020. It's one of my most popular classes from the trade shows. So better running, bolder, more beautiful embroidery with a faster cycle from concept to completion. So you can sign up at uh, bit.ly and this is on screen bit.ly slash Eric DD all in caps. Uh, and I'm also teaching three units at uh, Impressions Expo Atlantic City. Like I said, we're still watching schedules, but it looks like AC is going off. So with AC going off, I will be there. Uh, the setup day is my first class. And then we have a couple other classes going on there as well. And there's the link to that. And as we all know, DAX Minnesota will be hot on its heels. So once again, the day before the show, I'm there for debating digitizing. It's my long three-hour piece where I talk about whether or not you want to get into in-house digitizing and uh, creative things you can do for it, the reasons why and why not, and how to get set up. So that is really my main thing. And then I've got a shorter one on specialty threads during the show. What awesome. do you have, Terry? 
Well, my uh, scheduling and estimating production time video series is uh, we moved it to Tuesdays because Aaron and I both uh, had a little bit of a scheduling con uh, conflict. But Tuesdays for five weeks starting on March 31st, that'll be seven o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. A little reminder to everybody, uh, Daylight Savings Time starts this weekend. Uh, my upcoming complete screen printing business course tomorrow, <laughs> I'll be in Chicago at Atlas Screen Supply over uh, Saturday and Sunday. March 18th, the day before Atlantic City opens up, just like you, uh, Eric, I'll be presenting 10 things you need to know about DTG printing. And uh, Saturday, April 4th, I'll be presenting on being a great screen printer at DAX Minnesota. Minnesota, And uh, the exact same seminar on April 25th, Saturday at DAX Chicago Land. And as always, all my events are on terrycombs.com under tour dates. Do you want to uh, share a couple of uh, Aaron's events as well, Eric? Absolutely. Uh, Aaron's got a lot going on. And honestly, I've been seeing all kinds of great stuff from Aaron. And a top thing on that is our successgroup.com has some great stuff happening. So check out their Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash our success group. Uh, he and Todd Downing really getting a lot of great education out there. And they're starting out with these uh, monthly and yearly memberships for this biweekly training they're doing. Uh, available at a low introductory price of uh, $59.99 a month with a better deal of $349.99 per year. And people are really loving those courses. And I've seen Aaron's been working hard developing that. Yeah. And make sure you congratulate Todd. He got married this past week. It's true. Congratulations, Todd, man. Taking the dive. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and the other thing Aaron's got going on here is the five keys to launching or growing your business video series is now available for standalone purchase at, at 75 bucks when you use the code SMILESTONES. Uh, this series is for anyone who wants to know what, uh, what you're spending to be able to set your goals for success, figure your true costs and your price your products for profit. Plus, anyone who wants to learn about upselling and providing a great customer experience. So I know people really like that series. So definitely check that out. Also, uh, Aaron is teaching at DAX Minnesota. He's got starting in e-commerce what works and what didn't uh, with his wife. She is joining him at DAX Minnesota April 3rd at 1230. And that's going to be really interesting. So got some definitely some personal experience with their own brand. So cool things to check out there. And of course, we're all going to be at DAX shows with the decorators community. So uh, Minnesota is going to have us in this awesome quad booth with plenty of room to lounge. We can hang out and enjoy. <laughs> and yes, we in have the inflatable people. couch. <laughs> the inflatable couch there. Stop by, sit on the inflatable couch, realize you may need help to get back out. <laughs> right. we're in booth 417, and I'll say from Kansas City, it was really cool to have people stop by and chat. And we got to do some live shows from there. Um, we did all kinds of great panels as well, and that's going on. So Dax, Minnesota, cannot wait to see all the people there at Treasure Island. So really cool stuff happening at Dax, Minnesota. Check us out there and definitely check out our successgroup.com and everything Aaron and Todd are doing. Exactly right. Okay, with that, I believe we can leave the shows alone and close this out because we're <laughs> way into bonus time, folks. Uh, and we've come to the close of another show. I have to thank Jeremy Picker with Amber Creative again. He was awesome. Thank you for coming on. All right. We want to thank Aaron working in the background today and our show producer and stand-in host, Eric Campbell. And thanks to our sponsor, Impressions Expo. Yeah, the thing I'm really looking forward to as well, next week, Christine Shreve will take over the microphones with the Women in Garment Decorating panel. And she's got another great group of guests lined up. She told us about that group uh, this morning. Fantastic yeah. people, and it should be great. I'm talking about uh, women and facing uh, crisis situations and conflict situations. And I think it's uh, it's something that is yeah. definitely a topic that people should listen in on. Awesome. Until then, I'm Terry Combs. He's Eric Campbell sitting in for Aaron Montgomery. And we are the two regular guys. Thank you for listening to Two Regular Guys. Check out our website at tworegularguys.com. That's the number two, regularguys.com. You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash tworegularguys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash tworegularguys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, tworegularguys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.